except for uh, Kyle uh, Dawson and Frank Vandenbosch, who arrived uh, in this past year, are going to be talking today. And so all of you will have an opportunity to get to know them and their research. And so obviously they're really looking for students. They have to start their labs. They, they really need people. And so uh, pay particular attention. And I've put um, most of the new faculty members in the middle in the middle uh, group. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide this, uh, these talk. We have 17 actual speakers, 17 faculty members that have research opportunities for you. Um, and we're going to divide it into three different uh, time slots. The first one will go about an hour from 9 now until about 10, a little after 10, and there'll be um, six speakers. And then we'll have a coffee break for about roughly half an hour. Okay, So we'll set up coffee up here and cookies. And that's just an opportunity for people to go to the bathroom, but also to chat. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be pretty strict on limiting questions and things because we have so many people to get through. If we really get going, then it would take all day, right? And nobody wants to stay here all day. So it's gonna feel a bit rushed. So that's just the nature of today. Um, it's you're not gonna learn all the details today. Obviously, the idea is just to learn, kind of get an idea of what's going on in these different labs. And then during the coffee breaks, you should take the opportunity to go and speak to the um, professors who gave their presentation in that previous group uh, if you're interested in their research. Okay, so please, uh, we're, we're, I'm hoping that all of the faculty members will stick around at least through their, for the, their coffee break following their, their talk. And so please take the opportunity to talk with them and get to know them and make contact with them. Okay, that's really important. So we'll divide it into three groups again. The first one is from 9 to a little bit after 10. Then we have about a half hour coffee break. And then we'll go about 10.30 to 11.30, and then another half hour coffee break. And then 12 to about 12.50, and then we'll have lunch. So if we get behind, that's another reason to schedule long coffee breaks, is in case we get behind. So I think everything should work out, but let's you know, um, try to keep things moving. Any questions about what's, what's going on? OK. So I'm going to start just because I'm already up here. And then, and then after me, Paula will follow. Okay, so let me um, um, let me just kind of give you very briefly again what, what we're doing in my lab. So we're uh, we're developing one of the things we do is we develop novel techniques for doing optical imaging with nanoscale resolution. Okay, so this is should be a little bit surprising to you to do optics at the nanoscale, and I'll show you how that works. Um, and then we're sort of using this technique and, and, and basically to investigate energy and charge transfer in nanoscale um, systems. And so this is kind of a condensed matter sort of project. Okay, so we have carbon nanotubes you'll recognize and, and something called the quantum dot. And then we also uh, are, have a long-standing sort of effort uh, to use this high-resolution microscopy to study biological structure and the relationship between structure and function in biological systems. Okay. Um, so how does this work? So uh, you know, usually if you, if you have a, just a normal optical microscope, you don't get resolution that's better than about half the wavelength of light. So in the visible range, that means about 300 nanometers or so. So how do we get nanoscale resolution? How do we get resolution that's kind of really at the nanoscale? Well, it turns out if you put a, a, a sharp probe in, in a light field, this is meant to be a laser, laser beam that's focused. If you put a sharp probe, that, that probe can act like a lightning rod and it can actually focus the light. Okay? It focuses it to a very small volume and therefore, if you have a bunch of molecules or some sample, then, uh, then you can actually sort of differentially illuminate those molecules with your lightning rod and you can obtain spatial resolution, which is much better than the wavelength. Okay? Um, and so it relies basically on the fact that the tip increases the, the local fluorescence signal. Okay. Here's kind of what this microscope looks like. It's a little bit hard to see, but we have it's just an optical system, and you have an atomic pores microscope on top, which is what gives you the sharp tip, and um, and some optics, and that's and that that's what we can go, makes it go. You're welcome to come visit the lab. Here's to show you that in fact you do get very good resolution. So what we did here to test the resolution was we took short pieces of DNA which we designed to be a very particular length, and we attached small fluorescent molecules on either end. So these glow. The, the, the DNA does not glow, but the molecules glow. And we put these on the surface, a bunch of them, and we image them, and you can resolve the two ends. Now keep in mind, if you just use a normal microscope, this whole field here, would the, the, these two little dots would actually just look like one big, huge dot that you wouldn't be able to resolve. Okay? So we did this for 100, 100 or so molecules, 
uh, like this, and we, sh we show that, in fact, we, we measure the spacing between them, and we show that, in fact, we have about 10 nanometer resolution. Okay, so, so the technique works in a simple way. I mean, it works on, sim on relatively simple samples, and the challenge now is to push it into more complex samples. Because of the way that we take our data, and I don't have time to explain this, basically, as this, this probe, this, this lightning rod, which, again, is enhancing the optical uh, um, rate, if you, if you, uh, we oscillate it up and down very fast as we scan it over our sample, and that actually allows us to make three-dimensional images now with nanometer resolution. So, for example, here's an object, which this is just a cartoon, this part, but here's real data, and the fluorescence when the tip gets gets very close to the sample goes up, and so you actually have this is a this is an image that's that's in this plane, this XZ plane. Um, and we can even do really three-dimensional imaging. Okay, so you can start to investigate the interaction between the, the probe and the sample, and you can do this in three dimensions with very high resolution. So you can study all kinds of interesting sort of optical effects. Okay. Um, so moving on, we can use this technique to, to, uh, to study energy transfer and complex materials. So people have proposed using things like combinations of quantum dots. Quantum dots are these small fluorescent particles made of semiconductor nanocrystals, and a composite material composed of quantum dots and nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, for photovoltaic devices. And there's a number of reasons for this. For example, quantum dots are tunable. Their absorption spectrum is tunable by just turning their size so that they could be made to absorb the, um, the solar spectrum very efficiently. And nanotubes have good electronic properties. Okay? So in order to actually sort of investigate this, you need to study the energy transfer. That is the, the transfer between the, the, the energy which the quantum dots obtain when they get photo excited and the nanotubes that you can make a current. Okay? So our approach to this is instead of looking at something very complicated is that we basically attach a single nanotube to a single metallic probe and then we just bring it close to a quantum dot because we have this technique. Okay? So again, we can do the same kind of thing that I showed you before, but now we have a nanotube and now what we can see is that it's very dark. Here's this little blue spot is where the nano is where the quantum dot sits. Okay, that's the that's the topography, and you can see this is optical data. And you can see it gets very dark when the tip is very close, which means that the quantum dot is actually giving up its energy to the to the nanotube when it's very close by. And this is more than just a pretty image. This is a huge amount of data in here. So, for example, we can actually just look along this this direction, this vertical direction, and you can actually make very quantitatively. Uh, measure, me, very quantitative measurements on this energy transfer. And you can fit this to models and sort of under, try to understand what's going on here. You can understand the physics behind it and how efficient this process is. It turns out to be very efficient. If you look when the nanotube comes very close to the quantum dot, you get nearly 100% energy transfer. And you can study that under the different conditions and for different length like, nanotubes and so on and so forth. And we're doing that. You can also do something really interesting. For example, quantum dots blink and you can actually see how these different internal states of the quantum dot, how they couple to the nanotube differentially. And that's kind of an interesting project that we're just sort of starting. So finally, again, this long-standing goal of ours to use this high-resolution microscopy to study proteins embedded in biological membranes. Okay? And so we have a project, we have a collaboration with a biologist here at the University of Utah. And this is, I just put this up there to, this is a particular system which we're trying to study. And the, I put this up here because this always makes me laugh. Because this is, a, this is in many ways, this is the bio, a biologist picture of the structure of this. Okay? It's a cartoon at this point because they don't actually know what the structure is. All they know is that all these proteins, these are all different proteins, this is meant to be a membrane. They know that they kind of get together, but they don't actually know what this particular structure forms. And it's actually a really important uh, system. And so we're trying to basically measure the, the structure. And so the way, what you need here is you need to be able to take the individual proteins parts, they fit together into some sort of architecture, some sort of network, and you need to be able to resolve individual parts and be able to know what part is what. So you need to be able to know that the different proteins are, 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 are different species of proteins and not the same protein. And so that's why optics is good, and but you still need the nanoscale resolution, and so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, here's, here is a, um, we have a new lab because we just moved, I've been here five years, but we just moved across the hall. So we have a nice lab that has um, uh, that can accommodate quite a few students, and um, it's basically got a nice we've got a, a nice optical setup. We have a couple of uh, different experimental setups back here. 
the whole microscope that I showed you sits in this in this uh, can right there. Okay, so please come visit the lab. And here's the people that do the work. So Chun Mu and Ben Mangum, these, these folks are just leaving. So Ben and Chun should be graduating very soon. Ben actually has a postdoc already lined up. Eyal Shafran is, the, is another senior student in the lab. Um, ben Martin is a master's student. Carl and, and Anil are just new students in my lab that started just a few months ago. And Jessica and Charles are some undergraduates that are working for me um, right now. Okay, so that's all for me. Um, we have about two or three minutes for, two, maybe two minutes for questions if anybody has any questions. I know that it's really fast, so it might be too fuzzy. <laughs> any questions at all? Yeah. Uh, CNT means carbon nanotube? Yeah, carbon nanotube, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to, um, to Paolo Gondolo. Okay, so um, here's his information. So I'm hoping to put these kinds of things together so that we can maybe, if the speakers are okay with it. <laughs> Uh, I really need to change my picture. <laughs> Carl, let me find you. <laughs> a little bit too fast. <laughs> you want copy break now? Dark matter is an extra invisible mass. 
And uh, I'm gonna focus on the dark matter. I used to do some research on dark energy, but the subject is very, is theoretical, it's become very dry, so, uh, because all the possible models have been basically ruled out except for one, and the observers are pinning it down to uh, exquisite precision now to the simplest and most impossible theoretical model where theory is off by just uh, um, 40 orders of magnitude. So if you have any good idea, it's, it's okay. But since I don't have any good idea of how to solve a 40 orders of magnitude problem, I talk about dark matter. So we know where the dark matter is. We know how much there is. This is thanks to the data. We absolutely have no clue on what it is. So, we, I, I'm, so what is the nature of dark matter? This is the subject of my research. And physicists, you know, have many ideas. So it's not really true we don't have a clue. We have too many clues. <laughs> Axioms, these are actually pictures of people who are, who are studying these things. This is uh, uh, Wilczek here on the like, Nobel Prize. So Axioms, supersymmetric weakly interacting massive particles that belong to this crowd, this most numerous cloud. Dark matter from extra dimensions, you know, space may and time may have more than four dimensions, three plus one, maybe 11. So there may be excitations in the extra dimensions, they may be dark and invisible. Maybe excited dark matter, it's a dark thing binary, and you got really excited to see it. There's a lot of publicity about him because he, he, he thinks he has found it in the, in the gamma ray data from the Fermi satellite. He has analyzed those images, and so dark thinks that he has found the dark matter. And he goes around giving a lot, a lot of talks. So that's one thing you can you do as a theorist. You go around the world and give a lot of talks. <laughs> New force in the dark sector. There's an invader there. I don't know. Which <laughs> okay. So these are all ideas that need to be tested. And there are three way, basically three ways of testing these ideas of particles for the dark matter. Accelerators, you, these are particle accelerators, you produce them in Geneva, because in Geneva they have the most powerful accelerator. So you produce them there, and, and, and you hope it is uh, the dark matter. You actually don't know if it is the dark matter, because you produce something in the laboratory, like neutrinos and other stuff. But neutrinos are not the dark matter. That's where you need a theorist, because the theorist will lead you from what the Experimenters observed in Geneva to the content of the universe. They cannot do that. <laughs> there are other experimentalists, however, who do that, they hope to do that, called direct searches for dark matter. They put some crystals or liquids in underground and they hope to that a dark matter particle will scatter in the detector and leave a trace. Not found yet, but that is indirect methods, all the rest where the dark matter gives signals come from outer space. Could be gamma rays, is a uh, artist drawing of the gamma ray Fermi satellite. Could be neutrinos, this is a person at the South Pole holding a photomultiplier. It could be uh, positrons, this is uh, the Pamela uh, detector, so it's a um, uh, balloon flight. And they got some intriguing news. So I'm gonna tell you about just uh, two topics they were working on and for which I need help from young people. So cosmic ray positrons, this Pamela detector I just showed you, produced the data on the left. So they say, what you see here is the flux of positrons from outer space. We call them cosmic ray positrons. The energy of the positron on the horizontal axis and the, not really the flux of positrons, it's the ratio of positrons to electrons in the cosmic rays. And our theory is has produced this black line, but the data show an excess. What could it be due? Maybe some other astrophysical source, maybe dark matter. And on the right is the total flux of electrons and positrons, again, as a function of energy. And there's also an excess. You see the, the revolution by the Fermi satellite this year, the arrow bars in these red points are much tinier than any other previous observation of the electron spectra in cosmic rays. So that's, there's this, this little bump here, which is also confirmed by another experiment test in uh, Namibia, where they measure the energy at a bit higher, higher range here, and it goes down and it matches the experiment data. So, are these excesses due to dark matter? 
Some people believe they are, like John Fink, John Finkmeyer. Pulsars of dark matter. On the left is a theoretical model for pulsars. You see the, the you can explain the, the electron plots, you can explain the positron to electron ratio. On the right is a model for dark matter. You see the line goes through the uh, electron spectrum and through the electron, the positron electron ratio. So now the question is how do we tell one from the other? What else should we look for? And you can do the simple things in a day or two to figure out what other tests you can make, but the complicated things that the experimentalists would believe, you need a lot of work. So here's what I use. This is a, call. This is a program, it's a computer package for particle dark matter, it's called Dark Susie. This originally was created for supersymmetry, which it, it, it's called SUSY, supersymmetry. We already version five is publicly available. You go to the URL, you download it, and on the Linux machine it works, even on Windows. And it computes a lot of things like the cosmic density of the dark matter, the accelerator constraints, direct and direct detection with anything you can think of. And we are now at work, and I need more people to work to extend dark surgery to the positron excess. It's a very hot topic. But we are the best in the world with this program. No one else has this uh, uh, tool, numerical tool. This really is a state of the art. It's the benchmark against which all other calculations for particle dark matter are compared. So if, we, if this is done quickly in the arc of a, of a year or less, then we still be the best and people will use this uh, tool to study the positron excess and compare. So that's one topic. The other is dark stars. This is very exciting. This is uh, the uh, realization that the first stars to form in the universe may have been powered by dark matter annihilation instead of nuclear fusion. In the sun, the nuclear fusion that powers it gives the energy. But dark matter annihilation is much more efficient. It gives you 100% of the mass. E equals mc squared. These are dark matter powered stars, for sure dark stars. They're not dark, they shine. And they have interesting consequences. They explain the chemical elements of the, hell, of the old halo stars in our galaxy, which is still a puzzle. But with the dark stars, we can explain it. They explain the origin of supermassive black holes in early quasars, which is also a puzzle because there's not enough time to put together a million solar mass black hole by the time we observe them. We observe quasars at very high redshift in cosmology, which is very early in the history of the universe. And the universe was too young to put together those quasars. But with these dark stars, we can explain it. So the key question is, can we find a dark star? How do we go around and find where it is? This is just a bunch of papers on the topic. And uh, we started a new, a new subject here in, uh, a couple of years ago. And we get in the news. When you do these things, you get in the news, and uh, your name appears uh, on, uh, on um, um, what was it, like, say, Spiegel in Germany and, you know, Desiree News here. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get on the web and, and you get translated in any languages. So that's one advantage of being a theorist because you can do this with a little amount of work, a computer, pen, and paper, and, uh, you know, just on your own, basically. Not with 25 collaborators. So the dark stars are here at the beginning of the universe, after the end of the dark ages, the first object that shine. And for kind of give you a hint of what kind of work we are, we have open here are the questions. How do dark stars ionize the universe? We don't really know, we're just working on it. I'm collaborating with somebody in the uh, University of San Francisco and and um, uh, Southern California, University of Southern California. How do dark stars change the production of heavy elements and the chemical abundances of the oldest stars? So we need a detailed calculation of that. We have just, you know, yeah, works more or less. There's no real number. Do the stars evolve into supermassive black holes that grow into our actual place? That's the same kind of thing. I said, I advertise this, they, they, they do, but we know with all the magnitude, we don't have the right numbers in front. Can dark stars power gamma ray bursts of high redshift? This is an idea we have. 
So you come up with an idea and then we need to work it out quantitatively because physics is still a quantitative science, at least I think. How can we observe dark stars? Maybe in, with James, Dal James Webb's space telescope, which is successor of the Hubble Space Telescope, maybe with neutrinos and gamma rays. So these are all open questions. So you see what happens that this, these questions are the interface of physics and astronomy, and astrophysics. So you need to have collaborators with expertise in different fields. And you end up working with people at other universities. And that's a big help when you're looking for a job because you're already known outside your little university of Utah physics department. You can get letters of recommendation from co-authors of yours who are at the University of Michigan or, or in other places. So if you want to know more about what uh, we do, you're welcome to join us at our weekly group meeting, Wednesdays, 3 p.m., 465 INSSC. Any questions? Thank you, Paolo. Okay. <laughs> Next up is Eugene Mishenko, and he is going to give a blackboard talk. Yes, let me bring you all to darkness. <laughs> you have you, yeah, I think yeah. I can use this one. I can have it. I as well, and so uh, everything that uh, goes about being underpaid and uh, spending long hours still applies. I can also add that uh, one of my previous students uh, wrote three papers, survived the same number of numerous breakdowns, finally landed a job as a postdoc. My other student, after writing the same number of papers, decided that uh, it's better to escape, so he is now at uh, a different university. So, uh, you got the idea. It's interesting, but uh, sometimes it's tough. Uh, I am working on low dimensional interacting electron systems, uh, much more mundane stuff than the universe. And I'll give you just an example of a problem I've been thinking about for the last uh, couple of years, and it's related to graphene. And graphene is a two dimensional allotrope of carbon. It's arranged in a honeycomb lattice, and it's simple and beautiful example of a electronic system. Uh, the lattice structure leads to honeycomb reciprocal lattice with uh, a honeycomb representing a uh, brilliant zone. And what's interesting about it is spectrum, its band structure is almost like a band structure, almost like a spectrum of relativistic particles but uh, in a two-dimensional crystal system and uh, with velocities which are 100 times smaller than the speed of light. And low energy states are Dirac cones with the spectrum very similar to electron-positron spectrum except for the value of the velocity. If you calculate the density of states how many states are available for a given energy, then you see an interesting thing here. So those of you who know about density of states, how do you think it behaves close to the Dirac point? It's how many states you have for a given energy. Well, it's actually vanishing at this Dirac point linearly, no matter if you are this is the same velocity, whether you are above or below the Dirac point. So you have very little states right at the Dirac point. And that's uh, where you have intrinsic graphene if you don't have any impurities. The thermal level is sitting right here. So you don't have any number of, society of uh, available states. Uh, then you would ask a question. What is the conductivity of graphene if no states are available? And the answer is, surprisingly, conductivity remains finite despite the vanishing of the density of states. So is it, this is easy to understand if uh, you bear me for a little quantum mechanical 
uh, calculation. So the Hamiltonian of this system is relativistic Hamiltonian with power matrices uh, working in a pseudo spin space rather than true space. And if you add electric field by means of vector potential, and you know that vector potential is related to electric field as the derivative with time. So for a fixed frequency, that gives you for your matrix element being inversely proportional to the frequency of the applied external field. So that's uh, E times velocity times electric field and inversely proportional to omega. Let's say the direction of electric field is in x. So as you go to lower frequencies and you look at the conductivity, what you are actually looking at are the transitions from a field lower cone to an empty upper cone. And uh, as the frequency gets smaller, so you uh, test very little states near the uh, vicinity of the direct point, your decrease in density of states is compensated by the library matrix cell. So the probability of transition, as you know, is proportional to the square of the matrix element of the transition from initial to the final state squared times the density of states at that particular <coughs> energy corresponding to half the frequency. So the uh, matrix element is proportional to E squared, E squared, electric field, omega squared, and times the density of states, which is omega divided by E squared, or A bar squared. So you see that one power frequency drops out, and what you get is E squared over omega h bar squared e squared. So that's the probability of each transition to happen. Now, how much energy is absorbed in each transition? So how much power is uh, generated by the electric field? Well, you have to multiply the probability of transition by the corresponding energy, which is h bar omega. And then you see that the Remain power frequency drops out, and the fact that the density of states is vanishing at the drop point it is uh, compensated by the diversion matrix element. Now, if this is a dissipated power, what is the conductivity? Do you remember the Joule E flaw? It's conductivity times electric field squared. Current times voltage. So for the conductivity, you are saying E squared over H bar up to some coefficient, which is equal to one force. And the conductivity of clean intrinsic graphene is of the order of the conductance quantum and contains only fundamental quantities. Now, uh, you can measure this conductivity by many different experiments, and the, the one experiment that I love the most is a suspended sheet of graphene uh, under the laser radiation. The laser radiation is going uh, perpendicular to the graphene uh, plane. Some of uh, the radiation is reflected, some is absorbed, and some is getting through. Now, the transmission coefficient of the two-dimensional system is uniquely related to its conductivity by the following relation. You can solve it, and this is a electrodynamic problem, and you see that uh, the transmission of the graphene sheet is determined by the ratio of conductivity to the speed of light, and this is nothing but the fine structure constant. So the fine structure constant determines uh, transmission coefficient of a 
mundane condensed matter system. And the experiments verified this theoretical prediction, not my prediction, uh, with great precision, 97.7%. So it's uh, much better than 1% precision. And the questions that I've been working for during the last couple of years are the following. Well, the first question is, why such a simple picture, which I can uh, explain to you in five minutes, works? So electrons are strongly interacting particles. Coulomb interaction is extremely strong. So why then no interaction effects? And uh, if you think about why there is rarely any interaction effects in mundane three-dimensional metals, that's because there is lots of screen by other electrons. Now, in graphene, there is uh, no states available. There is no uh, screen by other electrons. So interaction effects should be huge. Now, the question is, why don't you see any of those questions, or any of those interactions? And that's the, that's the question that I think I resolved over the past couple of years, and at least uh, uh, gave a mathematical explanation to why the interaction directions are weak, if not uh, simple, clear physical picture. And the second question is a uh, more well, recent one. Look, uh, the matrix element is diverging. So you know that uh, this is all perturbation theory. Perturbation theory works only if matrix element is less than something. Uh, and the something in this particular case is the lifetime of these states, <coughs> electrons and poles, in the two points. And uh, if you make frequency too small so that matrix element becomes greater than the inverse lifetime of those states, then this whole approach shouldn't work. And then you have a nonlinear response, and uh, if you know about optics, then you know about phenomena which is called radio oscillations in optics. And uh, the same thing happens here. You have two levels, one in the electron cone, the other in, in the pole cone, but if the lifetime is very long and your linear response theory doesn't work, it means that after this transition, the electron can still go back, back and forth, executing Rabi oscillations. If the lifetime is very short, then the electron excited quickly is lost from the excited state and the energy is dissipated. Now the question is what happens if uh, uh, the applied electric field laser radiation, for example, is so strong that it beats the lifetime. So you can see multiple oscillations back and forth. And uh, uh, it's a question that I've been looking at over the last uh, several months. Okay, uh, I guess my time is up. Uh, I hope I've bored you long enough <laughs> so that uh, you can now <laughs> get some enlightenment from another theorist. And if you have any questions, you can still. Any questions? Seconds. So everybody understood everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, there's a quiz upstairs before we finish, so don't forget to get that on your way out. People are getting lunch. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, in also lower dimensional systems, where we can uh, wear, <coughs> uh, to expect strong effects of interactions and strong effects of electrons, and in particular also of this is a huge broad topic, uh, but uh, I'm particularly interested currently in subset of the, uh, which are quantum spin systems, so this is the electrons, but uh, I'm interested in a much simpler problem when electrons are fixed in place, but their spins are uh, you know, motions um, in these uh, questions, and now we start with a couple of questions. But before I do that, so I just want to say I will not attempt to uh, describe uh, what I do in any uh, <coughs> significant details, but I would like to point out to this uh, web page, my research web page, where some time ago I tried to put together what was current by about a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, so different research topics and the links are you know, active and so Click there, you can get uh, not only references to relevant works, but uh, some kind of attempted brief explanation of uh, the <coughs> topics uh, that the list itself. So, mm -hmm. that if you're interested, you know, get a good idea of what I do and where my research is going. <coughs> so, uh, starting a little bit with the history. So, I just uh, three years ago when I was here, so I worked, uh, I was invited to work with two bright guys, so Jan Min San, who was a student and is now posted at the University of Indiana, and uh, Super Kenda Karai, who came to Postdoc and worked with me and with Eugene, uh, and is now Postdoc at UC in And so with them, we hooked up a little toy problem, which turns out to be very rich, uh, of, uh, <coughs> and in that problem, electrons were moving, but moving in one dimension, so it was a problem of quantum wire, uh, subject to magnetic field, which is simple, and also in orbit interaction, something which is uh, one of the topics more than in research, and plus interactions between electrons, and in playing with this <coughs> problem. Uh, we, we have figured uh, several uh, unexpected things of which I like uh, most. I just advertise so uh, we will describe the one problem which I'm working on uh, but uh, in a couple of minutes. But so uh, in the way of advertising, we discovered stumbled upon you know, very simple, uh, almost classical effect, which now however is not uh, <coughs> explained uh, written anywhere by anyone. And that effect uh, is the uh, analog of Van der Waals interaction, which you probably see in the mechanics course, uh, and which uh, describes how two neutral atoms interact because you can do a dipole transition. So uh, one electron, uh, say, you start with two atoms in uh, ground states, and then one electron goes uh, in one of an excited states that creates dipole moment next item, and this two guys talk, and so it's known under the name of Van der Waals interaction, uh, important in <coughs> many systems, uh, goes as a six power one inverse of six power distance of uh, atoms. So if you add to this uh, same setup, spin orbit interaction, so that every electron, each of the electrons that you have, uh, a spin, uh, and that spin is coupled to orbital motion, then out of such simple calculation, you end up with effective coupling between the spins, which uh, does not require electron tunneling. So it's kind of fun to this classical interaction between electron spins, and which is really bad news for quantum computers, but it was for us because we it's kind of fun. So, uh, so, so that really ideal in collaboration with this case. And uh, my current, uh, one of the current project is with Shane, who is here. 
and we are looking at a very different uh, <coughs> problem, but uh, that's kind of closer to my current interest. So we are looking for <coughs> magnetic uh, system, and are magnet in two dimensions, and there are many experimental realizations of such systems, and spins see that the vertices of the lattice, such as tiny segment of the lattice, is shown. And the important thing is that it's a uh, see triangle, so they each spin is coupled to six neighbors in this triangle fashion. And <coughs> this is a simple but extremely well studied and long studied problem, still uh, not solved uh, and is not completely. And so this model has very interesting property, even on classical levels, and that's what Shane is doing. So uh, you start at zero. You ask how magnetization, you apply magnetic field and ask how magnetization this behaves as a function of uh, <coughs> uh, And it's a you know, straight line. You take derivative of magnetization of a magnetic field, you end up with you know, some constant value. You do the same uh, calculation at finite temperature for classical model. And so here you see this constant, so this constant slope. And then something happens at intermediate fields. Uh, so fields are units of exchange constants. So, so that something happens, the slope suddenly drops, then rises up, and then it's constant again. And so what uh, this signifies non monotonic behavior of uh, derivative of the magnetization is uh, appearance of a very peculiar spin state where two thirds of the spins in the system point along the field, one third opposite to the field, and such structure is called up or down state. Uh, and the width of this dip is controlled by temperature. It's completely universal. So at zero temperature, it's zero, it's absent. You heat up system and you expect it to be more disordered, but instead what happens, entropy of this state is so high that uh, at intermediate temperatures you stabilize so it's entropic uh, effect uh, of finite energy. And so to give you an idea what, uh, of what I'm thinking at the moment, so I'll just spend three minutes on this problem. So I'm thinking of both Einstein condensation of spin waves or magnets. So you you know about Boston condensation uh, and in the field of cold atoms it's extremely uh, <coughs> uh, uh, important topic of research that's what uh, they do but magnetic systems provide another system where condensation can be studied and it's extremely interesting so we start again with Heisenberg model of some type and this JIJ so exchange interaction between spin and side I and J, usually in a short range, but we can make a long range to consider. And we apply magnetic field V times S along the direction. Okay. So if we apply extremely <coughs> strong magnetic field, then the uh, problem becomes trivial because all spins point in the same direction. It completely polarized spins. Okay. And you ask what is excitation in such a simple state? Well, this excitation you obtain if you flip one spin, okay, the spin down state, and give it some momentum so you make plane wave out of the spin down state. This is your particle. Okay. Uh, one okay. And this particle has some energy. <coughs> but um, uh, at very high fields, this energy you know, is a function of momentum, but it's always greater than zero. As you start decreasing, uh, magnetic field, so now going from high fields to lower fields, at some point you hit zero in this distortion. And so when you hit zero, or oh, you say the chemical effect, chemical potential, which is controlled by the field which fully polarizes spins minus current from the actual field. So when that becomes zero, uh, you have bosons, which are these particles of spin down plane waves. Uh, that's, so this happens at some momentum. and uh, you have zero boson and zero energy, so you have uh, condensation of them. Momentum at which they condense determines magnetic structure in the 
following way. So if your spectrum is such that just you have a single minimum at some point in momentum space, then uh, you can translate uh, this into spin structure and it's very simple. You have magnetization along field axis of the applied magnetic field, so rho is uh, <coughs> right the proportion of the field. Uh, and transverse component set is perpendicular to the direction of the field. You have a you know, simple periodic uh, function. So what if you see so spin is that think of it as a unit there with three components. So one component is constant. Another two components depend on position, arc position in space. So that position changes periodically. So what your spin does is you go from one point to another, it moves like this. So such structure is called uh, umbrella state or cone state. So the spins form these structures. If it happens, which uh, is only happens in <coughs> two-dimensional magnets, there is interesting geometry, that there are two, at least two, non-equivalent points at which spectrum of your particles touches zero as you go down in the magnetic field. Then you end up with very unusual, much more unusual state, when component of spin along the magnetic field direction is not constant, it is modulated in space, with twice the period in which transverse component. This state, if you look into the literature, is also currently known by the name of supersonic. So in this state, spin along the field, magnitude of the spin is not constant, it changes in a periodic fashion uh, with some period. And perpendicular to it, one of the components perpendicular to it changes uh, yeah, twice as slow. So this is very peculiar state. And then you can ask how this state changes into that, and that uh, is then uh, study leads you to study phase transition at zero temperature, which are known as quantum phase transitions. So this is a uh, <coughs> uh, sketch uh, of a problem of which I'm, uh, on one of the problems I'm working on currently. And so uh, if you're interested and you ask me approach me and try it. Let's say you want to try it, and I'll give you a problem. Solve it. Come back and I'll give you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and in a few years' time, you solve enough problems. Uh, and you'll have the answer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, questions? If Okay, everybody that one too. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the next two talks are given by members uh, of our two high energy astrophysics groups, which are more than just, our rep that are just represented here. Um, so we'll start with, uh, with Stefan Lebeck and we'll move on to Doug Bergman. Hello, good morning. Nice. <laughs> So, yes, with David Kida, uh, we work uh, in the field of uh, gamma ray astronomy. Uh, for this, we use these very large telescopes that you see in this uh, picture. Each telescope is 12 meters in diameter, so really big uh, instruments. And uh, as a company, I should stay in the computer for you. As a consequence, um, it's a big experiment that is operated by a large number of people. So if you were to uh, join a group, in fact, we'll be joining this quite big uh, collaboration that counts close to 100 people uh, distributed in uh, 20 institutions, mostly in the US, but also some in Canada and in England and in uh, Ireland. Uh, it's quite a friendly group of people, so you should not be uh, impressed. But it's clear that our students, they are constantly working with people who are not in new time. They, they always have exchanges with people in, everywhere in the most of the US, probably, and Canada. Um, still, we have a, a local uh, group where you see uh, myself in the background here, uh, David Kida. Since David Kida is the chair of the department, he's more like one of uh, Eugene's electron, he's in the conducting band, <laughs> while uh, I'm more like one of uh, Elliot's electron. Uh, 
I've just been going up and down my office in uh, South Physics. Uh, we have a bunch of grad students. I uh, know Michelle. Maybe the best way is to talk with them. Uh, Gary, uh, Paul, and we always have a team of undergraduate students who are working at uh, analyzing data on a daily basis. Every night we take data and we have to analyze these data, compare uh, our results to uh, the results that are obtained by our colleagues in other uh, groups in the US. Uh, we're, we're, quite a, oops, we're quite a big group in the, in the collaboration. Um, maybe one of the bigger uh, We work in a, at least with our local group, we are not very directive as far as topics are going. Uh, we like people to be interested and come to see us, you know, saying I would like to look into this. Uh, can you help me on how I should proceed or what, what do I need to do to get this analysis to work or can I calculate this in another way? I'd like people to be uh, leading their own uh, work and use us as a resource. Uh, as an example of this, uh, Gary recently was working on the observations that we made of this object which you see here. It's a uh, supernova remnant, which is of great interest for gamma ray astronomy because one of the big questions that we have in gamma ray astronomy is to identify sites of cosmic ray acceleration, cosmic rays such as studied by dogs or just of different energies. <coughs> and these, uh, these type of objects are excellent candidates for this. So Gary has been uh, producing these type of uh, sky maps and comparing them to what is observed at other wavelengths, especially in the radio. Uh, recently also we observed another type of object which is what we call an X-ray binary, so it's a regular star which has a compact companion. And as the two objects uh, orbit each other, they interact and apparently they produce uh, radiation at very high energy. And so Paul Nunez started studying how this uh, high energy radiation propagates through the radiation of the regular star and how much this radiation absorbs the high energy uh, gamma rays that we see causing the modulation in the flux that we observe as the two objects orbit each other. Uh, Michel Gui is working on, on an object that is uh, here to me. I've been studying this uh, galaxy for the last 10 years or so. Uh, this is NAP7. It's a huge galaxy at the center of a nearby very large cluster uh, galaxy. You see a picture of that galaxy in the table here, and you see a jet, which is the first jet that was ever observed at the beginning of the 20th century. And this jet is uh, powered by the accretion on the black hole, which is at the center of this, uh, this object. And recently, we, we made these observations here. As a function of time, we have the flux that we observed in a very high energy gamma rays. I didn't mention we are working at one TV of energy as a function of time, and you see that we had some uh, level of gamma ray activity, and then we, we observe a flare, and then we uh, did not get any more uh, signal. And at the same time of this flare, uh, we had colleagues who were observing the same object in X-ray and also in the radio, and their observations combined with ours um, made us think that this radiation the high energy radiation that we're observing is really coming from the very close vicinity of this black hole. So we, uh, Stefan um, Vincent, who's a postdoc working with us, and also with Michelle, we are working at trying to explain this uh, very high energy radiation in terms of um, particles being accelerated in the magnetic field structure is very, very close to the horizon of that. A, a model to describe this um, emission. Uh, recently, gamma ray astronomy at those energies have been, uh, we, have, we, have done, we have done huge progresses in terms of the number of sources that we have detected in the gamma rays of such extreme energies. And as a consequence, people both in the US and in Europe are now planning to construct much larger projects than the one you have seen on the first slide, which is for telescopes. So in Europe, they are working on a project that will involve something like 97 telescopes, covering a square kilometer. 
in the US, we are working on a project of which we found 36 telescopes that we recently designed for a different. Um, I'm just coming here, actually stepping out from a meeting of this uh, AGIS collaboration, but there are also CTA uh, members um, who are at this uh, meeting, so we are exchanging ideas and strategies on how to construct such something that large and how to be uh, operated. I don't think that's probably the time scales for this are probably not appropriate for students to uh, stop working on this, but that certainly would be easy to get involved in this type of very uh, international collaboration. A little bit on the side, we are running uh, a project, you see a picture of that project here, which is just 35 miles uh, west from here in Brandsville. These are two telescopes similar to the telescopes that we use for gamma astronomy, except that they are quite smaller. And we have deployed them, um, to use them as a prototype platform to test an idea to observe stars. So this is not about camera astronomy anymore, but we just have this idea of by using the same type of instruments, we could make uh, star, stellar observations, which are not possible at the moment. I cannot get into the, the details of this, but, but that's another opportunity to uh, work with us on some experimental project. Uh, maybe the last point is that, uh, getting back to camera astronomy, maybe, uh, it's very clear that our observations in um, camera astronomy to uh, reach an understanding of the objects that we observe, we need to collaborate with people observing the same objects at different wavelengths. And so we work a lot with the gamma ray uh, Fermi telescope, the SWIFT gamma ray telescope as well, uh, the Chandra telescope in X ray, we work with VLA, a radio um, observatory. Of course, now I told you about these AGs and CPA collaborations preparing the future for gamma ray um, astronomy. So we are, we are embedded in all sorts of very international collaborations, which certainly provide many opportunities of postdoctoral positions once you are in graduate. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them. Any questions? Thank you. Now we're going to move on to another high energy astrophysics group. Jennifer. Okay, hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm, there we go. So, I'm from the uh, Cosmic group here at, uh, at Utah. And I just came here actually from, from Raptors. Uh, anyway, so here are, uh, there's, I guess, currently five faculty members in the Cosmic Break group, uh, some listed there. Uh, the yeah. Gamma group has, has the chair. We have the dean, so he's, he's a little uh, more removed from research. Uh, let's see, Gordon, Thompson, and I uh, both arrived this year. We were at Rutgers previously. Uh, and Charlie Ray and Wayne Springer. Wayne is, is uh, doing a lot of astronomy work now with the, uh, the uh, telescope in Frisco uh, Peak. And we have a bunch of research faculty as well. Uh, I realized I didn't put, I don't have a nice picture of, of the Cosmic Ray group or or list of the graduate students in the talk, but okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so the Cosmic Ray group at, at Utah has actually a fairly long history dating back to the 70s. Uh, and the, one of the early projects was the FLIES experiment to look for Cosmic Rays with highest energies. Here's a picture of it. This is uh, uh, from Dugway Proving Grounds, about 100 miles uh, southwest of here. Uh, it's on a hill, and each one of these has a mirror in it and collects light onto the photo tube. And that was uh, the prototype, actually, was in New Mexico in 1975. And then in the 80s, uh, it was built, as shown here, and it ran until 1992. Uh, and that was followed up by the high-res experiment, high-resolution fly's eye. Uh, the prototype, which, uh, so here you see the old fly's eye tubes. They, they built bigger mirrors uh, and put them in buildings, and it looks like that. Uh, that's the prototype. And then um, the full uh, high-res was, was built later, uh, and it ran basically the early part of this decade. Here's a picture of the second site on another hill. There's two sites, so you can see the cosmic rays in stereo. Uh, and so this is about 12 kilometers away. The other site is over there somewhere. Uh, and then finally, our current uh, project is the Telescope Array Project. And I also realized I didn't put the collaboration list in this, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Uh, Utah, now that there's not much of a Rutgers group, is, is really the only US uh, 
uh, part of that, but there's a very large Japanese contingent who built much of it. Okay, so what are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are uh, high energy particles from space, and, and they're ionizing particles, uh, usually, uh, is part of the definition, and they hit the Earth's atmosphere. We're actually interested in the very highest energy of those, uh, which is uh, the highest that's ever been seen, is 3 times 10 to the 20th EV, and that's about, a, uh, I can't remember, tens of joules of energy in a, in a single microscopic uh, particle. And as such, uh, they're the highest energy cosmic messengers that you could think of doing astronomy or astrophysics with that are available. Uh, when they hit the, the atmosphere, they create a, a shower of particles uh, by, you know, they interact with the molecules of the atmosphere and make more, uh, make more particles in, a, in, a, in the interaction. The first interaction maybe is a few hundred particles. Those all interact and that creates a shower. And that's actually what we observe. Uh, and so we use the whole atmosphere, or well, some large segment of the atmosphere, as our detector. Uh, the shower particles ionize the air that causes fluorescence, which we observe, and they also, the shower eventually hits the ground and we can observe the particles to the ground, and we use both of those techniques. Uh, where do cosmic rays come from? Well, it's slightly lower energies than we look. They may come from supernova remnants, and uh, Stefan showed a supernova remnant. Here's another picture of one. Uh, actually, all the action here happens at the shock front at the edge of a supernova remnant for uh, accelerating cosmic rays. Um, AGM, that's the same picture that Stefan just showed of M87. Uh, and you have material streaming out here, so that, again, you have a shock front. Uh, and uh, so cosmic rays may be accelerated to these high energies as best place. Or, or another thing is Wolf Ray A stars have a, a very copious stellar wind. These Wolf Ray A stars are uh, stars 100 times the solar mass, roughly, uh, which spit off a lot of their uh, solar atmosphere uh, in the stream before they eventually go uh, supernova, which only is a few hundred million years. Okay, so at the highest energy, what do we want to do with cosmic rays? There's really three main topics. We want to measure the spectrum, uh, the energy spectrum, because that actually tells us a lot. It tells, uh, well, it gives us a lot of hints that we can try to decode. Uh, if you see a given spectrum, and they have to be accelerated to that spectrum, so there's an input spectrum based on what your acceleration mechanism is, uh, but then that's modified by everything that it passes through on the way to you. So if uh, at a given energy, uh, say, actually the given energy, 6 times 10 to the 19th, uh, you can create, the particle goes through the cosmic microwave background and is energetic enough to create the delta resonance, so the cosmic ray loses energy very fast. That has an effect on the spectrum, and it, and it basically cuts it off. Um, other things like uh, cosmic rays in the galaxy uh, are confined by magnetic fields, and, but they're less confined in higher energies because they have higher rigidity, and so that also changes the spectrum. Uh, second topic, composition. Well, what exactly are they? Are they protons? Are they heavier nuclei like iron? Uh, they could be anything in between. Uh, very high energy photons will, will look very similar. Um, and finally, where do they come from? Anisotropy. Uh, because they're charged at, at lower energies, uh, magnetic fields mean uh, change the direction of, of propagation so that you can't see directly back. But at the very highest energies, uh, depending on what the actual extragalactic magnetic fields are, they may point back within a few degrees of where they, they come from. So you can try to do astronomy with these particles uh, highest energy, and if they're photons, of course, they do point straight back. Uh, we can also imagine detecting neutrinos, uh, creating showers, which would also point back. So here's the telescope array. I believe uh, our group has the largest lab uh, <laughs> of any physics group here. Uh, this array here is about 900 square kilometers. It has two parts, an array of detectors on the ground, represented by the, the red dots here, uh, separated by 1.2 kilometers, and then three fluorescence detector sites uh, which overlook that same area. Uh, this is Route 6 here, and just off the picture here is Delta, Utah. So this is about two hours drive south of Salt Lake City. Uh, so it's hybrid detector, as I said, 507 surface detectors, which here's one on the ground. This is kind of an old picture. Uh, they look slightly different than that for the most part, so that one probably is still there. Uh, you have scintillators here in this 
uh, iron box and it's powered by a uh, solar detector, sends its, sends its data out on the radio detector, and this is how we deploy them. We, we truck them all out to one spot and put them out with a, a uh, helicopter. We put out all 500 basically in, in two months in, in 2007, so the helicopter was effectively to do that. Uh, the other half of the hybrid is the three fluorescence detectors, sorry. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, these two, well, all the surface detectors were built by our Japanese collaborators, and the two fluorescence detectors were, this is, this we provided, it was basically the old high-res mirrors, I'll show that in a second. Actually, this is the picture I made uh, using Google Earth and uh, uh, the model of the detector there, and so this is, a, the background is actually a, an image of the ground. But here's what it looks like in real life. So you have mirrors, uh, they collect the fluorescence light and, and shine it onto a uh, photomultiplier tube cluster, which is in that box there. there. Uh, oh, and here I have a picture close up of the mirror and the array of photomultiplier tubes that we see the image on. Here's the, the site provided by Hi-Res. These were the same mirrors that's used at Hi-Res as it was being built. There's no clusters there yet, but when the clusters are in place, they look uh, so the, here's the sort of analyses we do. For fluorescence detector, you see the light coming along the sky. So it looks like this, basically. And I've color-coded that with, with uh, time and the size is the signal. We see. So basically, you see the line in the sky. Uh, the time that comes lets you know the geometry, so you can fit that. And how different that is from the line tells you what the angle is. And you can see that there's not great uh, ability to tell that from the line. But if you also know when it hit the ground, you can get much better uh, resolution. So using both detectors together helps you in that way. Once you know its geometry, you can calculate how much light there was at a given point. So you see how the shower develops, it, it grows, but then eventually the shower particles are too uh, low in energy to create more shower particles, and so then it dies away. And uh, from that, you can determine from, so that the integral under here is basically how much energy was deposited in the atmosphere, which tells you the energy of the for the surface detector, uh, you see a footprint on the ground. So here you see the size of these circles is uh, how much hit in each one of those detectors for a given event. This is a very high energy event, somewhere in the upper half of the 10th to the 19th decade. And it's color coded again uh, with time. So you can see that it's sort of moving this way from the blues to the reds. And the black uh, uh, X there is the uh, just using this data, what the uh, reconstruction of the direction is. The red is if we use the hybrid, uh, because this was seen in fluorescence as well. Uh, and I thought I had another picture, but that's all right. Uh, so in conclusion, so with telescopes array, we're observing the energy, the highest energy cosmic rays available. Uh, we measure the spectrum, composition, and anisotropy of those uh, highest energy cosmic messages that hit the Earth. Uh, it's a deployed experiment. We're taking data. We expect to run for another, you know, for, for the next decade, essentially. We're also planning, as, as a more U.S. and, and U, Utah project, a low energy extension to work in conjunction with this. Uh, and we're, I think we're recruiting one or two graduate students uh, currently for, you know, in, in the next uh, few months we'll, we'll be looking for another graduate student. Any questions for Doug? Okay, so let's take uh, about a 15 minute break. Uh, there's coffee and cookies right out here. And then let's meet back here at 10.30, please, and we'll start the next uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.